Hello, everyone, and Namaskar. So today's podcast is a continuation of the book titled Ananda Murti, the Jamalpur Years. And this is the fourth chapter of the book titled Accounts Department, 1941 to 1947. The entire humanity of this universe constitutes one singular people. All humanity is bound together in fraternity. Those who remain oblivious to this very simple truth, those who distort it are the deadliest enemies of humanity. Today's humanity should identify these foes and build a healthy human society, overcoming all obstacles and difficulties. It must be borne in mind that as long as a magnificent, healthy, and universalistic human society is not well established, humanity's entire culture and civilization, its sacrifice, service, and spiritual endeavor will not be of any worth whatsoever. In 1862, the British established India's first railway workshop in Jamalpur. By the turn of the century, it had become Asia's largest home to the subcontinent's principal training facility for railway engineers, later known as the Indian Railways Institute of Mechanical and Electrical Engineering. With the growth of the workshop, Jamalpur soon became famous for its comfortable Anglo-Indian social life and its relaxed, small-town ambience. At the time of Prabhat's birth, it employed more than 12,000 people. About 1,000 of these were British and Anglo-Indians who enjoyed a social life that rivaled that of Calcutta and other urban centers in the empire. But in a far more appealing setting, several thousand sprawling acres of wide, tree-lined boulevards, and spacious meadows that reached to the edge of the Carcanian Hills. Railway employees could take long, picturesque walks and enjoy the charms of nature, or else entertain themselves with a full schedule of social pastimes. The Institute had its own movie theater, a six-lane swimming pool, four tennis courts, two billiard rooms, and a bowling lawn. Its dances were renowned so much so that railway personnel and their families came from all over eastern India to attend. There was little more that an Indian railway employee could ask for, that is, as long as he was British. As with most of British India, the posh residential suburbs and recreational facilities were off-limits to Indians. They were literally on the other side of the tracks. The railway lines neatly dividing the township from the institute. Indians comprised over 90% of the workforce, but they enjoyed little of the privileges that made Jamalpur such a desirable appointment for railway personnel. Still, Pravat would say years later that when he was young, it was the best town in all India. Lakshmi Narayana had joined the railway accounts department as a clerk in 1911. Having emigrated from his native Bengal following the death of his father at the age of 44, a fate that he would also share, his son was 19 when he began working in the same office, which consisted of a suit of spacious halls filled with bare top desks in the British bureaucratic style. Here employees would spend their days poring over paperwork and penning entries into the hundreds of ledgers that piled up on shelves and in cabinets, and in some cases directly on the floor beside their desks. Pravat signed on as a lower division clerk with a salary of 33 rupees per month, a slightly built 19-year-old with thick black glasses, whose short stature and quiet sober demeanor would not ordinarily attract a second glance. Most of the men he was now working with had worked with his father. Many of them had been beneficiaries of Lakshmi Narayana's homeopathic remedies, and they were happy to welcome the son who showed many of the same traits that had endeared them to the father. Like his father, Prabhat was methodical in his work habits, visibly sincere and uncommonly punctual. He would enter the office exactly on the hour each morning, generally finishing the work assigned to him ahead of time and leave exactly at five each afternoon. When Pravat joined his office service, 
World War II was in full swing. Despite its distance from the principal battlefields, India was feeling the effects. Prices skyrocketed on everything from rice to clothes. Many items became nearly impossible to obtain. Blackouts and curfews were instituted as fears rose over a possible Japanese invasion. And these fears were confirmed when the Japanese advanced on Burma in January of 1942. In February, Singapore fell. By midsummer, Japanese troops were nearing India's eastern border. Soon afterward, the first air attacks on Calcutta by Japanese bombers began, and the city underwent a massive evacuation. In Jamalpur, only 280 kilometers from Calcutta, and home to the empire's largest railway workshop, tensions were high. A curfew was instituted. At night, people were afraid to light a fire for fear of showing Japanese bombers the way to their town. Though the rapid entrance of the Americans into the Pacific after Pearl Harbor will help to divert Japanese attention away from India, tensions over possible invasion would continue until the war near its close. As might be expected, the war was foremost on everybody's mind. During lunch hour and break time, employees would gather together to discuss the progress of the conflict, catching up on the latest news from the battlefront, and wondering aloud how the war would impact India's future. When Pravat joined the conversation, his colleagues noticed that he would often narrate recent events from the battlefield or the political front in vivid detail, almost as if he had witnessed those scenes with his own eyes. News of these events would not appear in the local papers or on the radio until several days afterward due to a three-day news blackout on war-related incidents. When they asked him how he had come by news that had proven to be up to the minute, he would simply smile or change the subject. Pravat's astute analysis of the political ramifications of the war and his extensive knowledge about military procedure, strategy, and history seemed incongruent with his tender age and apparent lack of worldly experience. He was never at want for answers to the questions they put to him, and oftentimes, he would steer the conversation into realms his other colleagues rarely visited. Classical literature, linguistics, applied sciences, mysticism, philosophy. Often by asking them questions that he would then answer. Soon his desk became a meeting point during the lunch hour and break time. Pravat never left the office to eat in the workshop canteen. He brought a light meal with him from home in an aluminum tiffin carrier and would nibble at his food and talk with his colleagues until it was time to go back to work. During the course of these discussions, his colleagues discovered that Pravat was an accomplished palmist. In fact, they found that he was well-versed in all aspects of Hindu astrology, of which palmistry is a part. With the natural regard they felt for practitioners of this ancient Hindu art, they began seeking his advice from time to time impressed by the accuracy of his readings. They also began bringing their friends. Jiten Mandal had a friend, Vishwakarma, who was growing desperate because he had been unable to find a job. One day, Jiten asked him to come to the office to see Prabhat during the lunch hour. When Vishwakarma asked Prabhat if he would be willing to look at his palm to see when he might find the job, Prabhat told him that he did not need to see his palm. All he needed to see were the lines on his forehead. Pravat looked at him fixedly for a few moments. Then he told Vishwakarma that he would find employment on such and such a date. Vishwakarma forgot about the forecast, but when he received his appointment on the exact date that Pravat had foretold, he remembered the prediction and rushed to Jiten to inform him that it had proved true. On another occasion, one of Pravat's colleagues told a friend of his, Maritunjai Sanjal, about Pravat's prowess in the astrological arts. He assured him that if anyone could help him, it would be Pravat. Maritunjai, a head clerk in a different department, was nearing retirement age. Despite his best efforts, he had not been able to find a husband for one of his daughters, and he had grown deeply worried about it. He was a Varendra Brahmin and proud of his caste, but in his desperation, he agreed to humble himself and ask for Pravat's help. 
Bravat's reply was short and to the point. This is a simple matter, he said. The groom is sitting just in front of you in this office. Bravat pointed to a young clerk, Maitra Babu, who was sitting at a desk in a different part of the room, attending to his work. Approach his guardian, and your desire will be fulfilled. Mritunjai did as Pravat suggested. He found that the family was of the same caste and had just begun searching for a bride. The negotiations presented no difficulty, and the marriage was soon solemnized. As time passed, the scope of Pravat's counseling activities increased. One day, on his way into the office, he noticed that a coolie was sitting idle with a pain expression on his face. Pravat asked him if he were not feeling well. I want to work, sir, the coolie told him, but I can't. I think I need to go home and get some treatment, or else, if you have something you can give me for the pain, I would be obliged. I am not a doctor, Pravat said, but when the coolie repeated his request, he went and plucked a plant from the workshop grounds and instructed him how to make a simple medicinal preparation from its leaves. The next day, the coolie was back at work fully recovered. He told his fellow laborers that Pravat knew many medicines. After that, other coolies started seeking Pravat's help when they fell sick. Though Pravat was not a homeopath, like his father, his office colleagues also started seeking his advice for their medical problems, and he often prescribed herbal or naturopathic treatments as part of that advice. One of Pravat's colleagues was Gunadar Patra, who was also a practicing homeopath, and a student of natural remedies. He took advantage of his close proximity to Pravat in the office to question him about the remedies to different diseases, many of which he began using in his own practice. One day he asked Pravat to take him into the hills near the Kali temple to show him some of the medicinal plants that he recommended. As they were walking back, they passed a crowd of women gathered outside a house. He asked me why those people were gathered there, so I went and inquired. They told me that a boy of that house was sick, he was fainting and vomiting, and having fits, that they were worried might be epilepsy. When they went back and told him, he said he wanted to see the boy. He went into the house and asked the family to describe the boy's symptoms to him in detail. He listened to what they had to say, and then waved his hand over the boy's body. Then he told everyone that they could leave. He assured them, that the boy will be all right. I was a doctor and I was thinking, how was it possible that the boy could be cured without any medicine or treatment? The next morning I went again to that area. I used to go to the spring near there to collect drinking water. I went to that house and inquired how the boy was. The family told me that he was fine. They said that a man with glasses had gone there the previous day and waved his hand over the boy and after that he was cured. I suspect that he must have used some kind of mantra to cure the boy, and I wanted to learn. So I went and asked him how he had done it. He appeared surprised at my question and didn't seem to remember the incident. Then I reminded him that it was when we were coming down from the Kali Hills. He remembered and told me that there was no mantra, nothing like that. These things can be done by touch also, he said. I had trouble believing it, but as he assured me it was true, I was a doctor, he said, and I would also be able to cure patients by touch. Then I requested him to let me take the dust of his feet. On another occasion, one of Pravat's colleagues was deeply worried about his wife, who had fallen seriously ill and failed to respond to any of the medicines that the doctors had prescribed. He approached Pravat and asked for his help. Pravat closed his eyes for a few moments. Then he told him to bring him a certain red flower. The man brought the flower but instead of prescribing some medicines to be made from its petals, as he had assumed he would do, Pravar intoned some mantras and told him to keep the flower by his wife's bed. He promised that she would recover within 48 hours. When his wife recovered as Pravar had predicted, his colleagues spread the story around the office, adding to Pravat's growing reputation. Such incidents inspired confidence in his colleagues. They even began to approach Pravat for advice about matters that required little or no knowledge of astrology or palmistry. Mr. Ja, for instance, was unable to afford the costly funeral rites for his father, who had recently died. As per Hindu tradition, a Brahmin priest was needed to conduct the necessary rituals to send his father's soul to heaven. 
Unfortunately, the priest was charging 50 gold sovereigns for his services, far beyond Mr. Jaw's means, and his mother and other family members were putting tremendous pressure on him to pay it. Even if he spent a hundred times that amount, Prabhat told him, it still wouldn't do any good. You still wouldn't be able to send your father's soul to heaven, because heaven and hell don't exist. Other than the heaven and hell we created for ourselves in this world, through the consequences of our good or bad actions. Heaven and hell are just dogma, created by certain religious people, to exploit the gullible and play upon their fears. But Pravat Da, Ja said, even if it is just a dogma, I won't be able to convince my mother or my relatives of that. They'll never give me any peace if I don't perform the rites according to the scriptures. Pravat nodded. Of course, I understand. But do one thing. Ask the priest how far he can send your father's soul if he reduces his fee. The next day, Ja told Pravat that the priest had agreed to reduce his fee to 30 gold sovereigns. For that sum, he could take his father up to the gate of heaven, but he would have to open the heavy gates himself to be able to go in. I see, Pravat said, smiling. Go back to the priest and ask him how far he can bring your father if you pay him in silver. The next day, Ja told Pravat that the priest had made a lengthy recalculation. For 100 silver coins, he could take his father to the steps of heaven. From there, he would have to climb the long, winding steps himself to reach the gate. Can you afford 100 silver coins? Pravat asked. No, Pravat, da. I have a very large family. I don't want them to suffer unnecessarily. How much can you afford then? I suppose I could afford 30 silver coins, Ja said. Very well. Go back and talk to the priest. Ask him how far he can bring your father for 30 silver coins. The next day, Ja showed up at the office in a happy mood. When he had a chance to talk with Pravat, he told him that at first the priest had been quite annoyed. Finally, though, he had made a long calculation and told him that for that sum, he could send his father three miles from heaven. Pravat laughed. Very good. Tell the priest that your father was a healthy man who used to walk four or five miles every morning. If the priest can send him three miles from heaven, then he can cover the rest of the distance during his morning walk. The office was not the only place where people came to Pravat for advice or to have their palms read. People from the neighborhood would occasionally stop by the Sarkar house to seek his help with one difficulty or another. Sometimes the advice he gave was purely practical. One time a distraught young woman from the neighborhood approached Pravat's mother and asked Kavarani if she might be willing to ask her son's advice for a problem that she was having with her mother-in-law. That evening when Pravat came home from work, his mother explained to him the difficulty that the young woman was facing. She was new to the neighborhood, having married a local boy, and her mother-in-law was making her life miserable, a common complaint in traditional Indian society. As in most Indian households, where the daughter goes to live with the son's family, she was expected to do the bulk of the cooking and cleaning. The mother-in-law would wait till the girl had finished cooking the noon meal. Then she would lock the kitchen with a padlock and go out to visit friends, where she would generally take tea and snacks. The famished girl would have to wait for hours until the mother-in-law returned before she could eat. Pravat counseled the girl to put her own padlock on the door after the mother-in-law went out and then make sure she was not there when the mother-in-law returned. She should only unlock the kitchen if the mother-in-law promised never to lock it again, no matter what threats the mother-in-law might make. A couple of days later, the girl returned to offer her heartfelt thanks. Her mother-in-law had agreed not to lock the kitchen anymore. On occasion, Pravat's help took a more supernatural bent. Once, a rumor went around the neighborhood that Pravat had a magic mirror in which he could show the souls of the deceased and what people in distant places were doing. In actuality, it was not a mirror, but a pane of glass that Pravat had asked his brother Manas to paint black on one side, giving it a reflective quality. It was Manas' duty to fetch the mirror and set it up whenever Prabhat needed to use it. One day, the wife of Pandit Ramachandra Ja, Prabhat's high school Sanskrit teacher, came to visit Avarani. Mrs. Ja had not been present at her mother's death and had come to share the sorrow she was feeling. Prabhat overheard the conversation and later told his mother that if the old lady wished he could show her her deceased mother, 
as long as she promised not to be afraid and not to tell anyone about the incident. Mrs. Zhao agreed. She came over a couple days later. Mana set up the glass and set a candle burning before it. Ravad instructed her to concentrate on the candle. The old lady quickly slipped into a semi-trance state. While in that state, she saw her mother sitting in a boat. Afterward, she thanked Pravat and told him that now she could rest easy, knowing that her mother was safe and continuing on her journey. On another occasion, another old lady from the neighborhood was worried about her son and came to Pravat to ask for his help. Her son had gone abroad and she had not received a letter from him for some weeks. Pravat agreed to help and asked Manas to bring the glass and light a candle. The lady slipped into a trance and had a vision of her son going into a shop to buy food in the country he was visiting. The vision was enough to allay her fears. Avarani became worried that such seances would affect her son's health, and in fact, he did fall sick after one session. Pravat, who always showed the utmost respect and consideration for his mother, retired the glass and never used it again. This was typical of the relationship he had with Avarani. Each evening before bed, he would massage his mother's feet. Whenever he wanted to go anywhere, he would ask her permission. Even in later years, when he became preceptor to a multitude of disciples, each month he handed his salary over to her. She would then give him a small allowance for his personal expenses. Avarani was a devout woman who kept a small altar in her house, where she would perform her daily Hindu worship in front of a small image of Krishna. Pravat made it a regular habit to bring her flowers for her worship. Once, for a stretch of several days, whenever she placed a garland around the image of Krishna, she saw an image of her son sitting there in place of the idol. She rubbed her eyes and started her worship again, but it kept happening. Finally, she went to her son and complained that he was bothering her worship. It is because you love me so much, Pravat told her, that you keep seeing me. The rest of the family was well aware of Pravat's unusual abilities. But for his younger siblings, it was simply a normal part of their lives. One day, the Sarkar children were gathered at the dining table. Pravat was eating his morning meal before leaving for the office. Suddenly, the family cat jumped on the table. Do you want to see some magic? Pravat asked his younger brothers and younger sister. He made a small motion with his hand, and the cat froze, as if it had been turned into a living statue. The children crowded forward to have a closer look. They touched it, ooing and eyeing. At that moment, Pravat's mother came into the room. When she saw what was happening, she rebuked her son. Leave the cat alone, Pravat, otherwise it might die. Pravat made another small motion with his hand, and the cat started breathing again. It jumped off the table and ran away. His mother returned to her morning chores, mildly annoyed, but otherwise going about her day as if nothing out of the ordinary had happened. The other children were convinced that their elder brother knew everything, as their mother often told them. One day in early 1948, Himanchu broached the subject. Dada, you know everything. Can you teach me how to do it? I would love to be able to know everything also. Pravat frowned. It is not good to know everything, he said. Not good at all. You will not like it. There is reason why Providence does not allow this. A couple of days later, Pravat was sitting at the dining table with his cousin, Ajit Biswas, who was spending the holidays at the Sarkar house, while Pravat's younger sister, Bijili Prava, was serving them a snack, Avarani began scolding her for her lack of skill in household matters. You are going to be married soon, and you still haven't learned how to serve a table properly. What to speak of cooking? What will your husband think? Pravat started defending Bijili Prava until Avarani fell quiet and left her daughter in peace. There is no need for her to master such domestic chores, Prava told Ajit, once they were alone again at the table. The marriage that my mother is busy arranging for my sister will never take place. Pravat, it must be wonderful to be able to know what is going to happen in the future, Ajit exclaimed, shaking his head and marveling at his cousin's unique abilities. Not at all, Prava told him. It is not a blessing. If anything, it is a curse. You see, my sister is destined for a short life. She will not live to see her marriage day. That is why I wish 
that she be left in peace so that she does not face any unnecessary troubles in her final days. Think about it. Whenever I see her, I am reminded that her death is fast approaching. You see a healthy young woman. I see her death. Just imagine how difficult it will be for someone to act naturally or be at ease with their friends or family if they knew that someone close to them was about to die. There is good reason why Providence has arranged that human beings should not know what is to happen in the future. The next day, Pravar asked Himanshu to accompany him to Calcutta for a few days. When the two brothers arrived back in Jamalpur some four or five days later, they found the family in a state of mourning. Their carefree sister, Bijali Prabha, had died the previous day of black fever, a disease that had shown no signs of its imminent arrival when they had set off for Calcutta a few days earlier. Pravat's family continued to pay visits to Bamumpara, where everyone still called him by his nickname, Bubu. Anil Ghosh recalled what those visits were like. Even though Bubu was a younger relative, I still showed him much deference. We would visit him as soon as we heard of his arrival. One day we saw that Bubu was doing something inside his room. His grandmother was with my sister-in-law. On inquiry, she replied, Bubu is sitting in meditation. He practices meditation and contemplation for long periods. The last time when he was here and was meditating for a long time, I curiously peeped inside the room through the window. I saw him levitating. His body was floating a little above the ground. I got frightened and closed the window. It is better not to disturb him while he is practicing meditation. But now, it has already been some time and he is about to get up. Sure enough, after a while, Bubu came out. Seeing me, he happily embraced me. Bubu was always an effusive person and had a pure nature. He would mix freely with us all. It is difficult to describe the joy he gave us by raising various topics for discussion. At that time in our village, there were two very educated gentlemen, Sachi Dulal Mitra and Gopi Krishna Mitra, who was a chartered accountant. Both were older than Bubu. It was fascinating to watch them in any discussion or argument, be it deep philosophy, literature, ethics, sociology, or other topics. Bubu's knowledge of so many different subjects churned everyone's mind. He would lucidly explain any subject by quoting various Sanskrit verses to support his contentions. It appeared as if he had crammed all the Vedas, Vedanta, the social cults, Puranas, and Tantras into his brain. Whatever subject others asked him about, Bubu gave clear, precise replies with the requisite illustrations from various sources. Everyone would be completely satisfied with his replies. Naresh Kosh, who was five years younger than Pravat, had formed a habit during his childhood of following him around whenever he got the chance. He also recalled those visits. When he came to Vamumpara, Bubuda would speak elaborately on various subjects, including linguistics, history, Bengali literature, philosophy, and spirituality. I noticed that Bubuda spoke effortlessly on the gradual development of Bengali literature. I most enjoy his descriptions of the step-by-step -step evolution of the various Prakriti languages derived from Sanskrit. I particularly enjoy listening about how original Sanskrit words became transformed over the ages and how they have come into modern Bengali. He could speak many languages fluently. He would explain various philosophical topics, quoting profusely from the Vedas and Upanishads. We were delighted to watch his extraordinary memory in action and his deep knowledge on different subjects. Occasionally, he spoke on different schools of philosophy like Shaiva, Shakta, Vaishnava, Saora, and Ganapatya. He would speak on so many things at a time that we would simply lose the trail. People said Bubuda could read palms very well. I say that he never read a palm. I have watched him. He would ask the person to stand erect and simply look sharply at him from head to toe. It was as if he were taking an x-ray. Then he would speak rapidly without any hesitation about the person. It is difficult for me to understand how he can enter a person's body and mind. Once, my elder brother, Narayana, developed a brain disorder. The family decided to commit him to a mental hospital. My father wrote to Bubuda, seeking his advice before taking any action. Bubuda respected my father very much. 
In reply, Bubuda advised against sending my brother to the hospital. He prescribed him some medicines, asked that he practice some yoga asanas, and gave dietary instructions. Because of that letter, there was no need to send my brother to the hospital. Naresh's brother, Suresh, also recalled his impressions of Prabhat at that time. When I was studying in college, we often discussed Bubuda among ourselves. One day, I plucked up my courage and said to Bubuda, Why don't you read my palm? Though he loved us all very much, we were in some ways afraid of him. He said, Tell me what you want to know. Up to what level will I study? How far do you want to study? He asked. Up to MA? Of course, he said. You will pass your MA. But it won't be easy. And you will have to struggle hard. You won't pass it at one go. I then wanted to know about my future financial situation. After thinking a while, he said, Money will come to you, but from early on, you will be burdened with debts. Then I wanted to know about my future reputation. Buddha said, Well, you will have a good reputation, but your unpopularity will be no less. And the most interesting thing will be that friends unrelated to you will praise you, whereas your own people will criticize you. What about my longevity? You will live a long life, but you will have several accidents. Then Bubu consoled me. Whatever be your fate, an invisible power will follow you like a shadow and help you whenever necessary. Suresh then detailed how each of Pravat's prophecies came true. The 18 years it took him to pass his MA and the 18 accidents, one of which left him in a coma for seven days. If I go on telling, he said, how many times and in how many ways Bubuda saved me and my family from difficulties and catastrophes, it would become an epic. The grace and blessings of Bubuda have always shielded me. On one of these visits to Vamumpara, Prabhat was sitting with Gopi Babu when Gopi started telling him about a yogi named Bamakyapa from the Birbhum district of West Bengal. Gopi was convinced that he had great spiritual powers. Once a ticket collector put him off the train because he didn't have a ticket, as soon as he was off the train, the whistle blew, and the driver started the engine, but the train wouldn't move. One of the passengers told the guard that the person they had taken off the train was a great yogi. The train would not move until he was allowed back on. They tested this by allowing him back on the train. As soon as they did so, the train started moving. One needs some kind of spiritual power to do this, no doubt, Prabhat said but it is not a very high class of spiritual power. This, by itself, doesn't mean he is a great yogi. Gopi Babu raised a suspicious eyebrow. Could you do it, he asked. Prabhat smiled and changed the subject. When are you going back to Calcutta, he asked. I'm going back tomorrow, Gopi said. Good. I am also going tomorrow. We can go together. The next day, Gopi Babu stopped at the Sarkar house on his way to the station. I'm not quite ready yet, Prabhat said when he saw him. Anyhow, we have time. There's no hurry. Pravada, I have urgent work in Kolkata. I can't afford to miss the train. Then you go ahead. I will be along presently. Gopi Babu hurried to the station and proceeded to the platform after buying his ticket. The train was standing on the platform and the passengers had already boarded. Then Gopi saw Pravada in the distance, approaching the station at a leisurely pace. He shouted for him to hurry. The train was about to leave, but Pravat didn't quicken his pace. The train blew its whistle, but Pravat continued to stroll calmly toward the station, as if he had all the time in the world. Finally, he entered the station and went up to the counter to buy his ticket. The whistle blew again, but the train still failed to move. Only when Pravat got into the train and took his seat next to Gopi Babu did it start to move. Gopi looked at him distrustfully, but didn't say anything. When the train arrived at Bandal, where it was scheduled for a long stoppage, Gopi got up with the other passengers and started toward the platform to take a cup of tea. Better not get out of the train, Prabhat said. Today we'll only stop here for a couple of minutes. Nonsense, Gopi said. It always stops in Bandal for at least 20 minutes. Gopi had barely ordered his tea when the signal sounded and the train started to move. He rushed back to his compartment and asked Prabhat in a vexed tone of voice, how it was that he knew the train would only stop there for a couple of minutes. Pravat smiled. The train is late. It was delayed in Shaktigar. Now it is making up the gap. Soon after Pravat joined the office, the British government announced 
the creation of the Indian Engineers Force, a voluntary adjunct to the Indian Territorial Army, designed to train young Indian engineers to assist in the defense of their country. Those who enlisted would be required to devote a certain number of hours on weekends and after work. They would also be sent for periodic short training stints to different parts of India, including West Bengal, Assam, and the Northwest Frontier Province. In return, they would be paid a stipend of eight annas per day. With his family in need of money, Pravat added his name to the list. He was quickly promoted to corporal and put in charge of a small platoon of Indian cadets who soon developed a strong sense of loyalty for their young Bengali platoon leader. On one training excursion, a British officer came for inspection while Pravat was absent. He went ahead with the inspection without waiting for Pravat to return. When Pravat returned, he rebuked the officer for having conducted the inspection in his absence. One of Pravat's men heard the altercation from the barracks and came out with a loaded gun. He saluted Pravat and asked him in which direction he wanted him to shoot. The officer beat an immediate retreat. On another occasion, several of Pravat's men complained to him about one of their comrades who kept a locked chest under his cot with biscuits and other delicacies that he never shared with his fellow cadets. Pravat listened to their complaints and promised to deal with it. Let us do one thing. I will get him out of the tent tonight on some excuse. When I give him the signal, sneak into the tent from the back and make some sounds like an animal might make. Leave when I give the signal again. That night, Pravat invited the greedy cadet to go for a walk. As they were walking, he gave the signal, a loud cough. Within moments, they heard strange sounds coming from the empty tent. His companion halted suddenly. Pravat da, did you hear that? Yes, it sounds like a wild animal has gone into the tent. It must be sniffing around. Do you keep any food in your tent, biscuits or any such thing? Well, yes. That is the problem then. It must be trying to get at the food. Baba coughed again, and the sound ceased. I don't hear anything now, he said. Let's go take a look. Cautiously, the two men entered the tent. They saw signs of disturbance around the cot. Just as I feared, Pravat said. It was trying to get into your chest. Oh no, what do I do? What happens if it comes back while I'm sleeping? I suggest you leave some of your food outside at night for the animal. He'll eat it and go away. Otherwise, who knows what might happen? The cadet followed Pravat's advice, and that evening his comrades were able to enjoy his unplanned generosity. It is not known to what extent Pravat continued initiating disciples during the years leading up to independence, but he would occasionally be seen in the company of wandering mendicants, such as were seen from time to time in any Indian town. Townspeople would sometimes spot him in their company during his evening walks in the solitary areas near Kalipahar and Death Valley. One afternoon in 1944, Rameshwar Baita, a neighbor and a classmate of Mana Sarkar, was passing by the Sarkar house in Keshapur along with his friend Ganesh. He noticed Pravat sitting on the porch reading his newspaper, as Pravat often did after arriving home from work. On the small platform across the street, a group of men from the neighborhood were playing cards, a common sight there in the afternoon. A man dressed in tattered clothes was sitting on one side of the platform, laughing to himself and speaking to no one in particular. Obviously, some kind of madman, Rameshwar thought. It was nothing new. He had often seen beggars and crazy-looking people sitting there in the late afternoons and early evenings. He had always assumed it was a good place to beg, and he had seen this particular fellow there for the past several days. This time, Ganesh wanted to stop and watch the card game. Rameshwar told him that he was in a hurry to get home but he obliged his insistent friend for a few minutes. As they were standing there, they heard the madman laugh and exclaim, They call me mad. The Lord of the Universe has come to Jamalpur and is working in the railway workshop, and still they sit around and waste their lives playing cards. Fools, and they call me mad. The men playing cards winked at the two boys and shook their heads, laughing uproariously. Sure thing, Pagal, madman. The Lord of the Universe is in Jamalpur. They added a few more derisive comments before returning to their game. Rameshwar and Ganesh joined in their laughter and then continued on their way. Rameshwar thought nothing more of it until years later when he took initiation 
and started hearing stories about Pravat's earliest disciples. Then he remembered how Pravat would sit on the veranda for a short time after work to read the paper or enjoy the cool evening air. Rameshwar would often say hello to him as he accompanied Pravat's brother, Manas, in or out of the house. From time to time, he would notice strange people sitting on the platform whom he mistook for beggars or crazy people. Later, it dawned on him that they had actually been mendicants and yogis who would sit there to catch a glimpse of the master. Pravat continued to write letters to Indian politicians. As the date for independence approached, he corresponded with Shyam Prasad Mukherjee, president of the Hindu Mahasabha. In regards to the demarcation of the borders between the future states of Pakistan and independent India, the British representative responsible for border demarcation was Sir Ratcliffe, who was working together with two Indian ICS officers, Chaudhuri Muhammad Ali, representing the future Pakistan, and H.M. Patel, representing India. Patel was not so familiar with the Punjab and Bengal, the two large Indian states that were being carved up in the formation of East and West Pakistan. As a result, areas were being awarded to Pakistan that would severely compromise India's access to Kashmir. In the northeast areas of Assam and Tripura, as well as contributing to various other problems, Shamprasad raised these points on the floor of the provisional Indian parliament. When Nehru and Vallabhai Patel questioned him as to where he had come by this information, he told them that it had come from one PR Sarkar, an employee of the Jamalpur Railway Workshop. This was the first time that the name PR Sarkar came to the attention of Nehru. After independence, Nehru, now Prime Minister of the world's newest and largest democracy, kept a secret but watchful eye on the man who had been the source behind Shamprasat's provocative comments on the floor of Parliament. Years later, after Nehru had died and his daughter Indira Gandhi had turned the Prime Ministership into a dictatorship, Nehru's Chief of Intelligence, B. N. Mulik, confided that after independence, Nehru had asked him to keep an eye on two organizations, the Radical RSS and the Muslim League, and one man, P. R. Sarkar. By this time, the watchful and secret eye of Nehru had morphed into a very public mistrust and antagonism on the part of his daughter toward the former railway employee, who was by then the guru of India's largest and most controversial spiritual movement. Some of Pravat's suggestions were acted upon, and some were not. But by the time of the partition, much harm had already been committed that could not be undone. Later on, those political leaders involved in the partition would receive caustic criticism from Pravat in his analysis of the events that led to the dismemberment of the country and the genocide it occasioned, criticism that would not endear him to Indira, whose father had been one of the principal architects of independence. According to Pravat in the 1930s, the British government had begun implementing a systematic program to encourage communal divisions, such as religious and caste differences, in order to undermine the cause of Indian independence. The principal failure of India's leaders at that time, he pointed out, was their failure to adequately combat these divisions. Some political parties were openly based on communal sentiments. They gave their support to the British policies in exchange for favorable considerations from the outgoing rulers. Other unscrupulous leaders took advantage of the scope afforded by the Government of India Act to secure ministerial positions for themselves and provincial autonomy for their regions, to the detriment of the nation. They committed severe blunders, practiced appeasement in the face of communal demands, and turned a blind eye to political errors for which the nation will later suffer. In Pravat's opinion, the reforms introduced by the British in the 1930s and 1940s, such as the Montague Chelmsford Report, the Communal Award, or Ramsay MacDonald and the Government of India Act 1935, did incalculable damage to the unity of the nation and led directly to the partition of the country. As Pravat later explained to his disciples, factually, as per the Government of India plan at the time, India was trifurcated, while Bengal, the Punjab and Assam were bifurcated. Sindhu and the north west frontier provinces went out of India. This was the result of the communal award, and unfortunately, the great patriots of India 
supported the Camino Award. They failed to learn the lessons of history. At that time, there was no mutual faith. There was want of mutual understanding. That is why the country was divided. Otherwise, the British could not have divided the country. There was both physical disintegration and psychic, or rather, psychosocial disintegration for want of proper political education. On the morning of August 15, 1947, following the stroke of midnight, India attained its independence. In the weeks that immediately preceded and followed, an estimated half million people were slaughtered by communal death squads while trying to cross the borders into India or Pakistan. One of the greatest genocides in modern history and a direct result of the willingness of India's leaders to allow the division of their country. For better or for worse, the bloodshed that accompanied India's independence and the creation of West and East Pakistan, later Bangladesh, ushered in a new era for the subcontinent, home to the planet's oldest civilization and its newest democracy. It also marked the end of an era in Pravat's life and the beginning of another. The quiet, mysterious youth who had steadfastly kept his spiritual depths hidden from the eyes of all but a few was about to begin the concrete materialization of his life's work, a mission that would leave a mark not only on India, but on the entire world, in a way that the politicians who read his letters and either accepted or spurned his advice in the years leading up to independence could never have foreseen. Thank you.